Let's make Minecraft. If you've been watching my videos, you know this is not the first time we've been working with 3D. But so far we've only been using ray casting. And using ray casting for Minecraft doesn't sound like a good idea. Ah my god! I forgot about this. Obviously we need to use something more advanced, something that only cool kids use. And since Vulkan is too hot and DirectX is too direct, I decided to learn OpenGL because it's open. Huh? Huh? We're gonna use this website called Learn OpenGL to learn OpenGL. After reading the first chapter, here's what I learned. OpenGL is an API. OpenGL is not an API but a specification. And OpenGL is a state machine. Also the core profile is better than the immediate mode. Obviously. Anyway, learning theory is done. The next step is setting up OpenGL in our project. For window and input handling, we're gonna use GLFW, which I'm gonna call G for short. In order to install G, I also had to learn CMake. Oh, you're asking what is CMake? Well, <laughs> CMake is a cross-platform free and open source software for build automation, testing, packaging, <gasps> and installation of software by using a compiler independent method. But it's not a build system, because it generates another system's build files. Anyway, after some more suffering, we now have a header file that we can include in our project. But we're not done yet, because we also need to include a library called GLAD. As far as I understand, the locations of OpenGL functions are not known at the compile time, which means we have to retrieve them manually. But since we're too lazy to do that, we can simply use GLAD to do it for us. So I'm glad we're using it. Boo! Get a better material! And this concludes the OpenGL setup. It's time we write some code. First we initialize G. Then we set the OpenGL version to 3.3 and its profile to core. For obvious reasons. I also made it impossible to resize the window. Because screw you. Then we create a window and check whether or not we created a window. Trust issues. If everything is good, we make the windows context the main context of the current thread. Don't ask me, I didn't understand either. Then we load GLAD and define the size of the rendering window. This concludes the initialization so we can finally start the game loop. For now the game loop will have two functions. The first one is called swap buffers. Our window uses two image buffers for rendering. The front buffer is what is shown on the screen. And the back buffer is where we draw stuff. Once we're finished with the drawing, we call this function to swap the buffers. The second function is called poll events. This function checks if any events are triggered, like keyboard inputs, mouse movements, zombie apocalypse, etc. I also decided to change the clear color to blue to represent the sky. And at the very end, before closing the game, we terminate G. Let's run the game. We did it! Now that we have a window, it's time to draw something on it. And like any other OpenGL beginner, we're gonna start with a triangle. When we were working with SFML, the coordinate plane looked like this. The origin was located at the top left corner, and the bottom right corner had the same coordinates as the screen size. The coordinate system we're gonna use in OpenGL is a lot similar to the one you saw in your math books. The origin is located in the middle, the top right corner has the coordinates 1 and 1, and the bottom left corner's coordinates are negative 1 and negative 1. Here we define the vertices of our future triangle. Now in order to turn this into this, we need to go through 6 stages of the graphics pipeline. The first one is called the vertex shader. It takes the vertices and transforms them into different vertices. In our case it won't do anything though. Then comes the geometry shader. I won't bother explaining it to you since we won't use it anyway, at least in this video. Next we assemble the shape and turn it into pixels aka rasterization. Then comes the fragment shader where all the magic happens. During this stage we work with lighting, shading, texturing, etc. In the final stage we take all the shapes and blend them together based on their depth and transparency. The shaders are written in a different language called GLSL so we'll have to learn it too. Here are the fragment and vertex shader codes. And before you call me stupid, I'm just doing what LearnOpenGL told me to do. We compile both shaders and link them together in the shader program. Then we generate a vertex buffer and put the vertex data in it. We also need to define how the vertex attributes are stored in the data. First we define which attribute we want to configure. Since there is only one attribute, the vertex position, we put a 0. Then we define its size. We put a 3 for x, y and z values. Next we define the type of the values and whether or not we want to normalize them. 
The fifth argument is called a stride and it defines the space between the attributes and bytes. We just put the size of each vertex. And finally, we define the offset of the first attribute. We also need to introduce a vertex array object. I don't know what it does exactly, but who cares? Let's just see the triangle. Oh yeah! Look at this masterpiece. Look at how sharp and orange it looks. Do you know what's better than a triangle? Two triangles, also known as a rectangle. When working with OpenGL, we'll be mostly using triangles to draw different shapes, which means that some vertices will overlap each other. Now obviously throwing the same vertex 3 or 4 times doesn't sound like a good idea, because it isn't. Introducing the indices array. From now on we'll only be throwing the unique vertices and defining the order in which we want to draw them in this array. For this to work we also have to use a thing called elements buffer object. We'll be storing the indices array in that buffer. And there's our rectangle. The triangle was better. Yeah. To make sure I understood the material, I decided to do the exercises as well. In the first exercise we have to draw two triangles. I mean, we're already doing that, but I guess we can just change the vertices. Wow! Two triangles! How the hell did we do that? In the next exercise, we have to create separate VBOs and VAOs for those triangles. For that, we need to turn these variables into arrays, and also write this long and pointless piece of code. And as a result, we see the same two triangles, with no changes, and I'm still clueless about what the hell do vertex array objects do. The final exercise wants us to change the color of one of those triangles. This one actually sounds like a fun challenge to do. We just need to create a second fragment shader that fills the pixels with a different color. We also need to use different shader programs before drawing each triangle. The website wanted me to make it yellow, but since I'm a rebel who doesn't like following the rules, I made it green. Let's summarize what we've learned so far. We created a window, drew our first triangle, drew our second triangle, and made it green. So far so good. It's time we talked more about shaders. Now I don't want to explain to you how shaders work while looking at this thing. So let's put the shader source codes in separate files. I also downloaded the GLSL syntax highlighter for Visual Studio to make the code more readable. To keep things organized, let's create our own shader class. It will load shaders from files, check for errors, and change the values of the uniforms. But dude, you didn't explain what uniforms are. Oh yeah, thanks for reminding me. So uniforms are basically global variables inside shader programs. The cool thing about them is that we can change them outside of the shaders. This means we can create a uniform in our shader file, then change its value based on the current time in the main file, and use that value to set the color of the triangle. And as a result, we get this cool glowing animation. We're not done with shaders, because there's something I need to talk about that will blow your mind. If you look at our vertices array, it's only storing their coordinates. But what if I tell you that each vertex can have its own color? No, yes. We just need to add RGB colors after each coordinate. We also need to update how OpenGL should handle the vertex attributes. In location 0 we'll be storing the vertex coordinates. And in location 1 we'll be storing its color. Then we pass that color from the vertex shader to the fragment shader, where we set that color to be the fragment color. And there we have it. The rainbow triangle. Wow, shaders are so cool. I know. I think we've learned enough about shaders. Now we're gonna talk about textures. Real quick, this video is sponsored by my Patreon page. If you want to gain access to develop some of my future projects and videos, including exclusive content, consider becoming a member. Now let's go back to the video. To work with textures, we have to include another header file called stb image. This allows us to load images as texture data, which we can put inside texture objects to use later. We also need to generate a mip map for our texture. You're probably asking what the hell is a mip map? Sometimes the object we're drawing can be so far away, it'll appear smaller than my self-esteem. In that case it'd be stupid to use a large texture to draw like 20 pixels on the screen. To prevent that, OpenGL will generate smaller versions of the same texture. This concept is called mip mapping. This means we'll be using different versions of the same texture based on the distance. Now in order to put the texture onto the shape, each vertex will have two additional attributes. These attributes tell us which point in our texture corresponds to which vertex. So our vertex data now looks like this. These are the vertex coordinates, these are their colors, and these are their texture coordinates. All that's left to do is to tell our fragment shader to use the texture data when drawing the pixels. 
And there we have it. Our first texture. Yes, it's blurry. Yes, it's upside down. But we did it. Congratulations. Now let's get to fixing. The reason why the image appears upside down is because OpenGL works with a regular coordinate system. But our image is stored using the vertically flipped version of it. This can be easily fixed by adding this line of code. And to fix the blurriness, we just need to tell OpenGL to use the nearest neighbor filtering instead of linear. We can also define how OpenGL should wrap the texture if the shape is bigger than the image. I chose the third option. And now it works correctly. Almost correctly. As you can probably guess, this is because the texture is a square, but our shape is not. I just changed the screen resolution to be a square to fix this. One final thing before we move on. Let's try adding the colors to our texture. Oh yeah. Wait, hold on. Now we're talking. Anyway, we're finished with the textures. The next thing on our list is transformations. For this we have to learn about vectors and uh, matrices. Wait, I can do this. I can do this. Identity matrix. Easy. Scaling. Easy. Translation. Easy. Rotation. Uh. Uh. Oh, go to hell. It turns out we didn't need to learn all of that since we're just gonna use a library that will do everything for us. Whoops. Anyway, to transform the image, we need to create a transformation matrix. First, we make an identity matrix. Then we're gonna rotate that matrix by 90 degrees around the z-axis. Let's also scale it down by half because why not? Now we just need to multiply every vertex by our matrix in the vertex shader. And there we have it. Our first transformation. Now if we can change objects like that... <gasps> does that mean we can animate them as well? Let's try rotating the matrix every iteration to find out. Oh my god it works! It's alive! I'm alive! Woohoo! He's losing it. This is amazing! Yeah. Now that we learned a bit about transformations, it's time to use them to bring some 3Dness into our project. Every object will be transformed by three matrices before it's drawn. The first one is called the model matrix. It defines the location of each object in the environment. The second one is called the view matrix. It makes objects appear as seen from the camera. The final one is called the projection matrix. This is where we can add some perspective and also delete the vertices that are outside of the view. In practice it looks like this. Our model matrix will lay the image on the floor and rotate it. Our view matrix will move us two units away from the image. And our projection matrix will make everything look 3D. The projection matrix basically creates a giant thing called a frustum. Here we can define the field of view, the aspect ratio, the distance to the near plane, and the distance to the far plane. If an object is close to the near plane, it'll be drawn big. If an object is closer to the far plane, it'll be drawn small. And everything outside of the frost room will not be drawn at all. There is also an orthographic projection, but I'm not gonna talk about it since we won't use it anyway. All that's left to do is to apply all of the transformations in the vertex shader. And there we go! The 3D graphics! Yeah, this doesn't look that impressive. But don't worry, we can fix that. We just need to change our flat rectangle into a handsome looking cube. Okay, we're about to see our first cube. Are you nervous? Because I am. 3, 2, 1, let's go! Oh f I just forgot to change this. 3, 2, 1, let's go! Oh yeah! It works! It works! We can be happy! Why you're not happy? I said we're happy! If you haven't forgotten, we were actually working on Minecraft. So let's change our cube into a grass block. There we go. Does this look like Minecraft to you? I don't think it does. Let's try adding more cubes. We just need to draw the same cube 10 times. Now we're talking. Alright, I think we can end this video here. Big thanks to all of my awesome Patreon supporters. Especially Victor Fernandez, Adam Kunzler, Kartoffelbauer1000, Wayne Rasmussen, Baptiste Jors, and... Sinden Meidi by Truns Naluland by NSDS via Shush Nine Comps Nonulo Dokokyu Arktesh Room Blurb Tesh in any Menanum Good Jobs Dio. And you thought I couldn't do it. Don't forget to join our Discord server and be sure to like and subscribe. Now, can you please help?